Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with a purpose. And it's important that every single human being strives and puts in their best effort with complete focus toward determining what that purpose is. Why would God create all of this in vain? Why would God create all of the creation if there was no ultimate objective toward this creation of ours? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us very clear and deliberate instruction within the whole of Qur'an of why we have been created, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But before getting toward that point again, it's important and vital to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has surrounded us by so many means by which we are able to seek closeness to our Creator. As we mentioned last night, that there are these signs that God allows to be manifest within the skies and within the earth. That of the sun, that of the moon, that of the stars, that of the trees and that of the oceans and the rivers, all of these are meant to be a means by which we are able to connect with our Creator. Through an understanding of who we are, our own selves, we are able to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَنْ arafa nafsa فَقَدْ arafa rabba. According to the tradition, that the one who knows his or herself knows their Lord. <coughs> Through an understanding of who we are, why we have been created, through an understanding of who we are in terms of the characteristics or the abilities or the potentials that we do have, we're able to understand in translation of who exactly our Creator is. Through an understanding of the verses of the whole Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for the clarity in spite of all of the ambiguity to really show us a very clear direction of why we are here today. And sometimes it's important also to understand that it's healthy to ask certain questions. Toward posing questions like, why is it that I am created? What is my purpose in this world? Why am I created today? Why do I live in 2019? Why was I not there during the time of the Prophet wasallam, so my eyes could have borne witness to his most beautiful face? As we recite in one of the du'as that are recommended to be recited on the day of Arafah, we say, Allahumma, uh, Allahumma inni amantu bi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wala, walam ara fa'arrithni fil jinani wajha. That, oh Allah, I believed and I bear witness and I testify that I have intense faith in the Prophet alayhi salam even though I never saw him. So allow for me to see him on the Day of Judgment and allow for me to see him on Paradise. Sometimes we wonder and we ask the question, how come I could have not been, or why was I not created so I could have been defending Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram. Which is why in the dua that I read in the beginning we state, لا يا ليتنا كنا معكم فَنَفُوزَ فَوْزًا عظيما. Oh Allah, how I wish we could have been there with them. So that we could have attained the most ultimate victory. Victory is demonstrated in the words of the man that we are here to recollect tonight. That of Qasim ibn al-Hasan alayhi salam. And we'll talk about that toward the end of the majlis. When he states, فِيكَ يَا أَمْ الْمَوْتُ أَحْلَى مِنَ الْأَسْفِ that in your way, O oh my uncle Aba Abdullah, the death is sweeter than honey. That shows us the purpose of this existence. We wish and we desire, we aspire to have given everything in the way of Sayyid al-Shuhada, Abi Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, and posing the question of why I wasn't created for that and why I'm created for this is again a healthy question. But if the questions are only questions and we don't find answers toward those questions, well then, they're just questions. And questions lead to doubt. And questions lead to confusion. And we're not able to find, again, the ultimate understanding of what is it that we have been created for. So it's important that we think about, again, that ultimate objective. And when we have an understanding of why we're doing anything 
that we're doing, just things make a lot more sense. For instance, when you go to college and you're studying for school and you're taking a class that you really don't want to take or you're studying for an exam that you really don't want to study for, naturally it's very easy to lose focus during the course of studying or during the course of that class. But what allows for you to be successful in spite of the fact that you don't really care about what it is that you're doing because you understand that there's an objective to it. So you have to go through the difficulties, you have to go through the challenges, you have to go up and down through the hurdles because you know that you need to pass this class so you can get your degree and your degree opens up a lot of other opportunities for you. After you graduate college, we enter into the workforce. And we have to do a lot of jobs that we don't necessarily like to do. You got to pay your dues, so we say. So you have to do certain things to allow for that sense of growth in your profession to occur. Again, if you keep in mind the ultimate objective, who is it that you want to be? What is it that I want to accomplish in this world? All of a sudden, things, they just make a lot more sense. And you have a sense of contentment to doing what it is that you're doing. How many of us have ever done something, taken a class, studied for an exam, even had a job, or been in a life circumstance that we just despised so much? Every day when we woke up in the morning, we did not want to go to work. Every day when we woke up in the morning, we did not want to go to class. Many of us, we all encounter these sorts of things. And the minute that you tell yourself that this is not what you want to do, the minute that our heart is not into something, there's a greater potential for failure. Fair? When I started my doctorate program that I was talking about last night, I told myself, there is no way in hell I'm going to finish this. I got a lot of other things to do. I have two children. I have a community. I travel a lot. There's a lot of other things going on. Why would I ever want to go and add something else to my plate? Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be satisfied with it, and I'm probably going to do another doctorate after that. There wasn't any contentment. But then slowly you tell yourself, I think I can do this. How many of us have been in those situations? Where you tell yourself, there's no way I'm going to get out of this. But then you just push forward. And you just strive. And you put forth a little bit more effort. And a sense of clarity removes that ambiguity. And a sense of precision isolates that confusion. And all of a sudden you know exactly what it is that you want and that you desire to accomplish. So you're able to do it. And you tell yourself, no matter what, I'm going to be able to do this. When it comes to life, every single day, if we don't have, have that objective, and if we don't have that purpose, then what's the point of living? If you think about it, what is it that we live for? Do we live for ourselves? Do we live for our spouse? Do we live for our parents? Do we live for our children? Many people, they say these things. Do we live for Hussein? What do we live for at the end of the day? And if we're not in a state where we're asking ourselves those questions, then that's a problem. What are our goals at the end of the day? Your life goals, what is it that you want people to remember about you after you pass away? Or a better question, what is it that you want the angels to remember you for? after you pass away? Or even a better question, what is it that you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have pride in when He's conversing with the angels in terms of your legacy? If we never thought about that question, then what are we living for? Are we living for work? Are we living for our job? Are we living for our profession? Are we living for our career? Are we living for our salary? Are we living for vacation? Are we living for food? What are we living for? Once we understand that this world is temporal, as we mentioned again last night as well, and that at the end of the day it's going to end, and at the end of the day it's going to fade, and at the end of the day, it's the end of the day. And we're going to enter into that space that's a lot smaller than this one. So make sure you guys are sitting really close together and moving forward, because it's going to be a lot more uncomfortable in that world after this one. So for my discussion tonight, inshallah, I want to work towards striving toward understanding the wisdom behind the purpose of creation 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to within the whole of Quran, and I want to do so on three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of asking the question, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me? Secondly, in terms of advices from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam, in terms of how he explained we should live our life. And thirdly and finally, what does the Quran instruct us in terms of our attitude, in terms of how our attitude to life should be? So let's go ahead and try to understand this conversation of the ultimate purpose of our existence in these dimensions. Again, the first dimension is why is it then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me? Natural question that I believe that every single human being asks at one point or another during the course of their life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with something known as the fitrah, the innate nature by which we are able to perceive and understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a light that God has created within our spiritual dimension that allows for us to know that there is a creator. And numerous verses of the whole Quran and other traditions of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, they tell us that God has created the human being upon this fitrah, upon this innate nature to know God, but because of our communities, because of our culture, because of our families, because of our upbringing, oftentimes we are molded in ways where either that light becomes more intensified, meaning that our knowledge of God is omnipresent and ever-present and ever-increasing, or it's something whereby that light dims and we're not able to really perceive the existence of a creator. But every one of us, deep down within us, we have that notion and we have that ability and we have that potential. As that man one day, he comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam and he states, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He says, O Ja'far ibn Muhammad, I'm an atheist. Prove your God to me. He says, I do not need to prove my God to you because you can prove God to yourself. Meaning that what? Oftentimes, in certain conversations, we get so caught up in terms of trying to rationally prove the existence of the Creator to someone else. Start with yourself, first of all, number one. Number two, the way to demonstrate the existence of a higher power, the way to demonstrate the presence of a Creator is to get someone to know themselves. This is within the traditions of Ahlul Bayt and I'm not trying to say that all of the other rational proofs and so on and so forth are insignificant, but I'm trying to say that this is the way that Ahlul Bayt used to debate atheists. It's not working. So the Imam والسلام, he tells him, he says, have you ever been on a ship? He said, yes. He said, have you ever been on a ship in the middle of the ocean and you look to your right and to your left, to the east and to the west and to the north and to the south and thought that I'm alone? He says, yes, actually, my profession is that I'm a fisherman and that's what I do. And many times I feel that way. He said, during the course of that moment, in the case that there were, was darkness to set in the sky and wind would begin to blow, what would happen? He said, I don't know. Obviously, fear would enter into my heart. He said, in spite of that fear, would there be hope? He said, there's always hope. He said, that hope in your heart is the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. The fact that you always have a sense of hope, the fact that you always see that there's a way out for you in spite of all difficulty, that way out is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart telling you that He exists, asking you and begging you just open up that door and see what it is that he has to offer to you. And in the hadith al-Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says, Ya Ahmed, Allahumma salli ala. He states, Ya Ahmed, khalaqtu al-ashiyya lak. Wa khalaqtu خَلَقْتُكَ الْأَشْيَاءَ لِأَجْلِكَ وَخَلَقْتُكَ لِأَجْلِي He states, O oh Ahmed, O oh Messenger, O oh Prophet, know that I created all things for you. I created all things in your way. 
and I created you for me. Again, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us some ability. He has given us some potential. He has given us some reason to live. It's up to us to dig deep down and find that purpose. Find that reason. Find our worth. And when we want to ask this question, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation? We want to do so also in three sub-dimensions. So what I did there, huh? <laughs> the first one of those questions that we want to ask is again, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create me? But the question that we need to pose before that is why exactly do we want to even ask this question? And the question that we want to ask before that is who exactly do we have to ask this question to? So we have these three questions that we want to ask and we want to ask them sort of backwards. So before we want to ask the question of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me, the prerequisite toward asking that question is what's the importance of asking that question. And the prerequisite toward asking the purpose of why God created us. And the reason why that question is important is a third prerequisite or a second prerequisite. And that is exactly who are we going to ask this question to. So let's start with this. When we want to know the purpose of creation, we start with asking exactly why is it or who is it that I'm even going to ask this question to. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> the microphone is here. The purpose of our existence is going to be delivered in high definition. I've never been happier in my life because God knows that my throat is about to I don't know what so the first question that we want to ask again is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us before that question we want to ask why is it important to know why God created us and before that question it's important to know who am I going to ask this question to who created me why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create me? Even better. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create me? Who am I going to ask? I call up my mom. Mom, why did God create me? I can. Mom's going to say, I don't know. If I have a question in regards to anything, I need to ask the one who has a sense of authority in regards toward that thing that I'm asking. Let me give you an example. If I have a question about Romeo and Juliet, the best person for me to ask is a professor of English literature. Or if he's present himself, asking William Shakespeare himself. Fair? You have a question about a movie, the best person to ask about that movie is the director. You have a question about a poem. The best person to ask about that poem is the poet himself or herself. Why else would we go and seek from anyone else a question that is as important and is as significant as the purpose of my existence and the purpose of my creation. So when I want to ask that question, who am I going to ask that question to? Mom? Dad? Grandma? Great grandma who told you about jinns? God bless all of our grandmothers. And all of our great grandmothers, those who have deceased and those who are alive, Allah bless all of them. I hope you don't take any offense. I'm not making fun of anyone's grandmother and certainly not my own grandmothers. May Allah give them long life inshallah. When I want to ask a question that is as significant as why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create me, the best person to ask is the creator himself. If we all submit to the fact in this room that I believe in a God, then this becomes easy because we know exactly who it is that we're asking. We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, why was I created? If I have a question about Romeo and Juliet, I ask William Shakespeare. If I have a question about a movie, I ask the director. If I have a question about a book, I ask the author. If I have a question about a poem, I ask the poet. If I have a question about a meal, I ask the chef. Everyone was excited about that one for whatever reason. <laughs> I do that a lot. I say something, and then I continue. But whenever I start with the Quranic verse, and I try to have everyone finish it, 
بسم الله الرحمن قل هو الله سي اتس ايزي وما خلقت الجن والانس الا ليعبدون جود So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why is it or what is the purpose of my creation? But before we get into the answer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers me, the question that we want to pose before that. There's a lot of space guys, a lot of space. Come inside, take a seat, be comfortable. I'd be more comfortable if you sat as well. Then I know that you're just relaxing as if we're in paradise because according to a hadith, the majlis of Hussein is paradise. The Majlis of Hussein is Jannah. So you come to the Majlis of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, and you get a little bit of what paradise feels like. And I don't mean me, huh? I mean the tears that you shed in the way of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, they are going to be a testimony on the Day of Judgment that you love the Messenger of God, a love that ran so deep that it shook your core. So be in a state and allow for your hearts and your souls to be at peace. Because you are in the majlis of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. What a blessing. There is no blessing like this one, my friends. So before we get into the asking the actual question to our Creator of why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and what is our purpose in the world, we ask that question, why is that question even important to ask? And again, this is an easy one. When you ask the question of why is it that God created us, again going back to the example that I mentioned earlier, when you know what your purpose is, you're just more inclined toward getting toward that ultimate objective. Every day when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? It should be your ultimate purpose in this world. Why is it not? Why do we think about everything else? The first thing that I wake up in the morning, where am I going to drink coffee? What am I going to eat for breakfast? What's on my Google calendar? All of these things come to our mind the first thing when we wake up in the morning. Where is God? The purpose of your existence, your Creator. It's as if that every single day, or even a better example, is for instance, that tonight you go to sleep and tomorrow you wake up, for instance, in the middle of... Give me something. Finish the sentence. Huh? In the middle of Kansas. <laughs> What's the first question that you would ask if you woke up and next tomorrow morning in the middle of Kansas? Why am I here? Huh? You'd ask the question, why am I here? Out of all of I would even prefer New Jersey to Kansas. Okay, maybe not, huh? The first question that someone would ask if they wake up in the morning in a completely different place than this one is, why am I here? Whenever, when have we ever asked that question to ourselves? The majority of people, when this question comes toward their heart, it's very easy and it's very quick to dismiss it. It's very simple. You can't sleep at night. You're wondering, what's the purpose of my existence? How many of you ever had that? Think about it. You don't need to say it. How many of us have ever really questioned and, and, and grappled with such a question that runs that deep? I can't sleep. I can't focus. I just want to know what this is all about at the end of the day. And if that question is something that we posed, but we're very quick to dismiss it, then we have to understand that we might not get that opportunity again. When that question is entered into our mindset, in the midst of our intellect, our aql, our soul, our ruh. Again, it's easy to dismiss it because no one wants to spend time toward digging to the depths of such a question when there's all of these other distractions that can take you away toward things that are far less important. Just focus with me for just one moment. Super important what I'm mentioning right now. When someone wants to talk about something serious, it becomes very difficult for most people. You're having a dispute, for instance, with your spouse. Having the conversation where you're able to reconcile the differences between your spouse, between your um, family member, between your really close friends, is not something that anyone likes to do. Because you have to have a conversation. And every one of us know that we don't like to have serious conversations. We like to be in a state of relaxation. We like to be in a state where everything is going well and sweeping all of the problems under the rug. 
And when a question is even deeper than just a relationship between two or three or ten people, and it's a question that really begins to fog your mind a little bit, like that of why is it that God has created me and what is my purpose in the earth, again, that's also very easy to say, forget about this. Who cares about this question? I got to go to work. I got to go to school. I got a lot of other things to do. I got places to go and people to see. But we can't allow for that to happen. We have to really strive toward finding that answer. And once we have the answer, and I'm going to give you the answer in just one moment, then we need to make sure that it's something that we're always working to utilize as a means to build ourselves. So now we know who to ask. Secondly, we know why it's important to ask. And thirdly, we ask that question. Oh Allah, why is it that you created us? Why is it that you created the creation? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in chapter 51, verse 56 of the whole Quran that, that I did not create jinn, nor did I create man, except for one reason. Except that they worship. A couple of really important, beautiful points about this verse. Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the verse by stating, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ He states, and I did not create. Let's take one sort of step back for just a moment to really understand the meaning of what it means when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and I did not create. Sometimes in verses of the whole Qur'an, He states, and we created. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and I created. Or, we did this, and over here, he, sometimes he states, and I, did, and, and, and I did this. Let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, he states, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ إِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّائِ إِذَا دَعَانِ He states, O oh Rasulullah, there's a man who one day comes toward the Prophet, and he says, O oh Messenger of God, tell me, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so far away that I need to call out to him with my loudest voice? Or is he so close to me that I'm able to whisper? At this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse of the Quran and he states, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ إِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيب And that when my servant, not when our servant, and when my servant asks about me, then tell him that I am near. In the first person. And I respond to the one who supplicates when they supplicate. I respond to the one who makes du'a when they make du'a. He doesn't say, and we, in the royal we, meaning that him and his representatives from amongst the angels, or him from and his representative from amongst the other creations. But sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for things to be very personal. Like that of when he says that I respond to your du'a. And in this verse he states, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَقْبِدُونَ And I did not create. Meaning that he takes creation and he brings them to himself. He makes it personal. And he states, illa liya'budun, except for the purpose of worship, meaning that there has to be something in which we're understanding the uniqueness and the closeness of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states, I created them so that they may worship me. In the same way that I mentioned before, he states, Ya Ahmed, khalaqtu al-ashya la'ajlik that I created all of these things for you, and I created you for me. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for Him. And what an honor. He created us for Him. He created us so that we may worship Him. He created us even though He does not need us. Does God need our worship? No. Can God do without our worship? Yes. Then why did God create us so that we worship Him? Except because He's God and that's the way that He wanted it. And that's an honor 
Why is that something that's confusing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us because He loves to hear our voices in du'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us because He loves for us to strive towards seeking a sense of closeness and proximity toward Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you to fulfill something, to fulfill a purpose, to fulfill an objective, and to go through all of the ups and downs of this life because He wanted to see which one from amongst us is going to put forth our very best effort toward being the best of His servants and the, word, and the best of His slaves. As, do, as we recite in Dua Kumain, we state, Allahumma j'alni min ahsani abidika naseeban innak wa aqrabihim manzilatan mink Oh Allah, allow for me to be the best of your slaves, for me to be the best of your servants. وَأَقْرَبِهِمْ مَنْ زِلَةً مِنْكْ And the closest in proximity toward you. And in the words of Ali alayhi salam, in that famous munajat of his, he states, إِلَاهِ كَفَابِ إِزَّنْ أَنْ أَكُونَ لَكَ أَبْدًا وَكَفَابِ فَخْرًا أَنْ تَكُونَ لِي رَبَّا Oh Allah, it suffices me as an honor that I am your slave, that you consider me your slave. And it suffices me as an honor that you are my Lord. Ilahi anta kama uhib, fajalni kama tuhib. Oh Allah, you are exactly as I love, so make me that which you love. That's what life is about. It's about understanding that God has created us so that we strive to put forth our very best effort toward being the best of His servants. But someone says, but He has a lot of laws, and He has a lot of instruction, and He tells us to do this, and He tells us to do that. Why is it that we have to go through all of these things? Why do I have to pray, and why do I have to fast, and why do I have to go for Hajj, and why do I have to give my money in charity, and why do I have to do all of these things that I don't want to do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability to stand and He gave you the ability to bow and He gave you the ability to prostrate. You cannot take 15 minutes of your day to stand and bow and prostrate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us breakfast and He gave us lunch and He gave us dinner and He gave us all of the seven meals in between that as well. And He says for 30 days, I want you to fast. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us wealth when we had nothing. He gave us status when no one knew us. He gave us an opportunity to live in this world and be a difference maker for people and to have the joys and the satisfactions of life. And He says, I want you to give out of your wealth. And you say, no, it's my wealth. That wealth came to you from God in the first place. Who are you to say, I'm not going to give out of this wealth? I'm talking to myself before anyone else. What a creation. What an, arrogant create, what an arrogant creation that we are. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've given you all of these things and I've created you to demonstrate my love to you and the only thing that I want for you to do is pray, make dua, strive your best in this world to being the best of my servants. And again, that doesn't only mean by prayers and by acts of worship. But even that we have a problem with, which brings me to the second dimension of my discussion. And that is the advice of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. In regards to how it is that we should live life. You know, we have so much opportunity from within our traditions to really allow for every single facet of our life to really reach its ultimate ability and potential. We have so much. We are so blessed to have the Prophet and his family Let me just open up a quick parenthesis over here for just one moment. Ahlul Bayt are the best. They're amazing. If we spend five minutes every single day, and again as a reminder to myself, five minutes every single day toward reading the traditions of Ahlul Bayt do you have any idea how it would influence and affect our life? 
Really, we have etiquette in terms of everything. A couple of nights ago, we talked about the etiquette of food. There's the etiquette of food, the etiquette of drink, the etif- etiquette of prayers, and the etiquette of other Islamic rituals. And then the etiquette of socialization. How should you communicate with one another? There's the etiquette of using the restroom. There's the etiquette of having relations with your spouse. There's the etiquette of all of these things because the tradition in itself is so holistic. And if we just took five minutes, three minutes a day, the etiquette of how to speak to your friends. We have advices in just about anything and everything, but we often see so much emptiness during the course of our life because we've not been exposed toward the wholesomeness that are the ahadith and the rawayat of Ahlul Bayt. Peace and blessings be upon them. And in this tradition from the Imam alayhi salatu was salam, he states, لِلْمُؤْمِنْ ثَلَاثُ سَاءَاتِ He states that for the believer, there are three portions of their day. It's a really, really nice hadith. I'm going to run through it really, really quickly. He states that for the believer, there are three portions of the day. And again, going back toward our previous sort of dimension, in terms of understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for worship, so that we are the best of the servants of our Creator. So we are ultimately always seeking to understand what does it mean to worship at the same time, because it's not only limited toward prayers and fasting and hajj and zakat and khums and jihad and amr bil ma'roof and nahyan al munkar and tawalla and tabarra and all of those things that we all memorize in Sunday school and we could run it backwards as well. It's not about that. It's more than that. That's one segment of it. But our lives holistically, they can be in the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every moment from when I'm taking a morsel of food and putting it into my mouth, from when I'm in the midst of sleeping in my bed in the darkness of the night. Every one of those actions can be a mechanism of me demonstrating worship and obedience and ta'at Allah. So he states, لِلْمُؤْمِنْ ثَلَاثُ سَاءَاتِ that for the believer, there are three portions of the day. And the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he states, and as for the first one, فَسَاءَ yunaji فِيهَا رَبَّا That the first portion of one's day, a day being a microcosm of a lifetime, by the way. Huh? And sa'a doesn't mean hour, it means a portion of time. فَسَاءَ yunaji فِيهَا رَبَّا that the por- first portion of one's day, or a portion, or a third of the day for the believer, should be in communicating with your Lord. It could be by means of Qur'an. It could be means, by means of prayers. It could be by means of du'a. It could be by means of other ritualistic acts of worship. But as I mentioned before last night, that worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being in a state of engagement with our Creator, can be while we're doing a lot of different things. It could be while you're cooking, it could be while you're commuting, it could be while you're doing anything. You're baking something, cookies, and you're remembering that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the razaq of all of these ingredients. You could be walking in the park, and you see a tree, you see a plant, you see a flower, and you look and you understand that through that existence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to demonstrate something to you. It could be while you're commuting to work and you're listening to the verses of the Qur'an and you hear all of the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know that He is Arhamur Rahimeen and that He is Khairul Ghafireen and all of a sudden allows for you to connect to the mercy of God and you raise your hand and you say, Oh Allah, and I'm a sinner and please forgive me. It could be doing anything فَسَاءَ يُنَاجِي فِيهَا رَبَّا The Imam alayhi salatu wa salami continues. وَسَاءَ يُرْمِي مَآ إِشَا And that the second phase of the life of the believer, the second part of these three, is that the believer should be in a state of taking care of his or her affairs. We have responsibilities in this world. We gotta work. We gotta go to school. We gotta pay bills. We gotta pay taxes. We have to visit family members. We have to go and do a whole load of other things. Life is filled with responsibility. God doesn't say that you need to lock yourself in your home and just worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all night. It's not about that. It's about understanding that those responsibilities and the fulfillment of those responsibilities are also an act of worship. 
They're also an act of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Spending time with your family according to a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, spending one hour with your, with your family is equivalent to 60 years of worship. That does not mean spending time with your family while you're watching Netflix. Huh? It means spending time with your family in conversation, in, in, in allowing for you to grow and benefit from one another, in expressing your affection and love with one another, and enjoying even a meal together without looking at your phones. One hour is equal to 60 years of ibadatillah. It doesn't mean that you cannot worship for 60 years after that. <laughs> Just mean that you get the reward of worshiping for 60 years if you spend time with your family. It's okay. You take your family, you go on vacation, it's okay. Even that can be an act of worship. Because we have responsibilities in this life and God doesn't say that we have to run away from them or that we have to isolate them or that we have to marginalize them. No, it's not about that. Take care of your responsibilities. Go to work. Go to school. Study hard. And know that out of those things, again, also realize that if you are doing it for God's sake, we want to have the best in the business. We want to have the best students. You want to be the best in your profession because you want to be able to utilize the tools that you're doing toward making a difference in the world that you're living in. And understanding that is also understanding the purpose of your existence in this world. So you're a cook, you better cook the best food. You're an architect, you better build the best homes and the best mosques and the best domestic violence shelters. You're a doctor, you go and you be the best physician and the best whatever doctor that other people are. <laughs> when I get my doctorate, everyone's gonna call me Dr. Sheikh. <laughs> Make dua for me, guys. Whenever anyone needs a doctor, just give me a call, middle of the night, I got you. <laughs> no? People do that anyway, though. Sheikh, got a problem. Oh, it's 2 a.m., but seriously, I got a problem. But Sheikh, huh? Can we eat all baked chicken? Huh? Can we eat all chicken? Oh, man. Can I have istikhara? Can I have istikhara? I think there's a gin in my closet. <laughs> You're lying, my grandmother's telling the truth. Fasa'a yurmi ma'a'isha. The second part of the day should be in taking care of your affairs and your responsibilities. And thirdly, the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he continues. And he states, Wasa'a yuhalli bayna nafsahu wa bayna ladhatiha Really beautiful, really, really nice hadith from the Imam alayhi salam. And he states, and as for the third portion of the day, he or she, the believer, should keep that time between them and themselves. Keep it for yourself. And do whatever it is that you enjoy, as long as it's useful, and as long as it's permissible, it's okay. Take the entire portion of your day, and again, see the day as a microcosm of life. Keep a portion of your life in ded dedication and obedience to outward expression to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A portion of your life in terms of fulfilling your life obligations and responsibilities. And thirdly, do whatever it is that you enjoy doing. And again, if God is in that equation, in every one of these three points, it starts with God, remember, huh? The first one is that you keep that first portion of the day in dedication and conversing with your Creator. When you start with God, certainly you're going to end with God. So you're going to see God in the beginning, then you're going to see God in the middle, and then you're certainly going to see God when you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. Again, as long as it's something that's beneficial, and as long as it's something that's permissible, you can't go away from the laws of Islam and say, but this is what I enjoy. So it's okay to drink peanut butter, banana smoothies once in a while. It's okay to spend time with your family members. It's okay to go out with your friends. It's okay to eat nice foods. It's okay to go on vacations. It's okay to enjoy the benefits of this dunya. But again, as long as you understand that God is in the equation, and you're never going to exceed those bounds and those boundaries, and when something doesn't go your way, in the midst of all of this, it won't bother you. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's in the equation. So something gets taken away from you, life becomes a little bit more challenging. Those obligations, they increase. 
Your hours at work, all of a sudden from 8 to 11, from 11 to 13, from 13 to 15, you got to do what you got to do. Because when you go to work, you come home, you have babies, and they don't sleep really well. Then you wake up in the morning in a bad mood all the time like me, but you got to do what you got to do. And you're okay with it, because you know that this is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their responsibilities, and you see God in the equation, everything becomes easier. That's why Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram, he says, Oh Allah, I've orphaned my children and my wives have become widows. But oh Allah, if it's for you, then keep on taking until you are content. Because I'm okay with that. And that brings me then toward the third dimension of my discussion, and I'll keep it brief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also told us that during the course of this life and fulfilling that ultimate objective, there's going to be a sense of understanding and mindset that we need to be in during the course of this life. You have been created to be the best of the worshippers, the best of the slaves, the best of the servants, the most obedient toward God. And the Imam والسلام, offers us instruction in terms of how we get there. But God says that you're not going to get there unless you know one thing about this world. And that this is important. And that thing that you need to know is that this life is filled with trials and tribulations. Number one. And number two, that this life is going to end. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states within the whole Qur'an, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ضَائِقَةِ الْمَوْتِ That every human being shall taste death. And another verse, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوءِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to try you in this world. أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ أَمَلًا Which one of you are going to have the best of deeds in spite and in light of all of the trials and tribulations. So you know you got to deal with it. And you know that it's going to come. And it's natural for it to come. But if you know why you've been created, then it won't bother you. Because you see God in the midst of that trial and tribulation, and you're ready to accept it. That's what we learned from Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam. How many of us have undergone a trial or tribulation in our life? Small, big, doesn't matter. Every one of us, we go through difficulties. It could be, for instance, that you lose your job, that you fail a class, that you get into an argument with a family member, there's a death in your family, an illness in your family, you have an illness yourself. Whatever it might be, we all go through challenges. We all go through difficulties. But it's about understanding that those difficulties, they won't consume you so much if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world as Darul Bala, as He states, and as our tradition states. Ad dunya sijnul mu'min, the hadith that states that for the believer, this world is a prison. Wa jannatun lil kafir, and it's a paradise for the disbeliever. So you have to go through certain things and they're going to hurt and they're going to be challenging and they're going to be difficult. But you know what? What's going to happen? You got to get through it. And if you don't get through it and if you don't accept that that's a difficulty and if you don't accept that that's a challenge, then we're going to be consumed. Consumed in a way that's going to distance, distance us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and don't get me wrong. Let me just take one step back. For those of you who know me, you know me as not someone who says that it's all doom and gloom. And that when you're going through a problem, you just got to be patient. I'm not saying that. Don't get me wrong. People go through real challenges and real difficulties where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us as the vehicles and the mechanisms and the agents for the light in the midst of their darkness. And you should know your ability and know your potentials in that regard as well. But what I'm trying to say is that if we remove God from the equation in the entirety, there's not a lot of potential for success at the end of the day in terms of understanding our ultimate purpose in this world. I'll just leave you with this. One anecdote. 
It is said that there was once this man, he was a employee at a mosque that was being built in Mashhad of Imam al-Rada alayhi salatu was salam. And Allahumma salam. In Khurasan, in a masjid known as Masjid Gohrashad. This particular mosque is now more recently part of the courtyard of the shrine of the 8th Imam of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu was salam. And during the time of the Safavids, it was this man's responsibility, like others, like his other colleagues, they were responsible, they were responsible as construction workers toward building this mosque that the Safavids had um, said that they were going to build. And it is said that these individuals, like, you know, blue collar workers, they're working 12 hours a day, they don't have a lot of money, they're not of a really high social status, but they're just striving their best toward you know, doing whatever it is that they can toward making ends meet. I don't know, that plastic bag is really bothering me. 99% It's my daughter. <laughs> it's not? Yeah, taking out the garbage, okay. God bless my daughter. She's gonna kick. Me. She's gonna kill me when she gets older. When she watches these, when I make her watch these videos when she's eight years old. <laughs> How many times do you make fun of me, Baba? It's not nice, Baba. She's never gonna talk to me ever again. Make up. My daughter. She talks to me every day. <laughs> so this guy is working twelve hours a day, fourteen hours a day doing his very best toward making ends meet. Anyhow, one day, during his lunch break, instead of going out to get food, he decided to just take rest, he took a nap, where it is that he was working. And when he woke up, he was woken up by his supervisor, who told him that the king and his family are coming toward visiting this mosque. They want to see the progress of it. And since it was out of the request of the king that this was going to be built, so he says, quickly, everyone get up from your sleep and make sure that it shows that you're working, like we do sometimes. Boss is coming in, turn off Twitter, get your computers on, put up those Excel sheets. So all of these guys, they get up, they start painting the walls or doing whatever it is that they were doing. The king walks in, he walks in with his family, and amongst those who enter into this mosque that was being built was the daughter of the king. And the minute that this man, he saw the king's daughter, he was blown away with her beauty. And he said, SubhanAllah, oh Allah, I want to marry this woman. Anyhow, that day he went back home after work and he went to have dinner with his mom and they sat at the dinner table. He was not very well off, his father had passed away, so on and so forth. And the king, he tells this, uh, sorry, excuse me, the, the, the mother tells the boy, why is it that you're so upset? Like he came home really, really upset, ate his food quickly, wanted to go to his room and go to sleep. He's like, no, no, you won't understand. He's like, no, I'm your mom, I'll understand. He's like, no, I really don't want to talk about this. She's like, no, no, it's okay. Tell me, tell me anything. So he's like, look, I was working. The king and his family came today. While I was working, I got woken up from my nap and I saw the princess. I saw the king's daughter. She was so beautiful. And I just, I, I'm in love with her. I can't stop thinking about her. And at this moment, the mom's like, great, go and, ask, go and ask her to marry you. So he's like, who am I? I just work over here. Like, I don't have an economic status that is that great. Like, you know, so she's like, just, you know, shoot your shot. <laughs> go for it. Slide into her DMs. <laughs> just do whatever it is that you got to do. So he's like, no, 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 no. Like, it's not for me. So the next day he goes to work, he comes back home. Again, he's upset. Mom says, why are you upset? He says, again, the same thing. He said, I can't stop thinking about her. A third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, a week passes. And the mom's like, look, I can't see you this upset. How about we just go to the king and ask to go and speak to this daughter of his and see if he would permit this conversation at the very least, or just give your proposal. If the king says no, if she says no, at least you can close that chapter and your life and end and move on with your life. He says, okay, fine, fair enough. He says, but I'm shy, but I'm embarrassed. The mom said, I'm not shy, nor am I embarrassed, let's go. <laughs> Boy dresses up really, really well. They go, again, they don't have that much. They go toward the king 
and they enter into the palace and the ministers and the whatever security and so on and so forth said, what have we, you know, what are you here for? They said that we want to speak to the king. This king was a really gentleman. He was an accessible person. He like loved his community, loved the people. But again, he's also a busy person. So all the security says, no, like you can't, you have to come with an appointment, send him an email first. Don't send text messages. Get it? Do you guys get it? No, no. I don't think any of you guys get it. <laughs> send an email is better than a text message. <laughs> and, you know, they're like, no, no, we really, really insist. We have to speak to him today. So they said, give us just a moment. So they went toward, the security went toward the king. The king was sitting on the throne. And he said, look, there's a family outside. They're standing outside and they want to talk to you. And they said that it's urgent and they must speak with you today. They live all the way out in the outskirts of the, in one of the villages. And they said, how can we help you? He says, how can I help you? The boy is very, very shy. So the mom says, look, king, the other day you and your family, you came to the mosque and my son was working in the mosque and he saw your daughter and he became very infatuated with her and we came we're, and we're coming here with a marriage proposal for your daughter. He says, okay. He says, what would you like for me to do? He's like, look, just go and take the proposal to your daughter. If she says no, no problem, we won't bother you anymore. But we just want you to at least take the proposal to your daughter. He says, no problem. That's fine. That's fair. No, uh, no worries. Good father-in-law, huh? He comes down. <laughs> he goes into the chamber where his daughter uh, is, 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 is staying. And he says, look, there's a guy outside. And he seems like a good person. He's come with his mom. She's very respectful. They came in a way of, you know, in a very classy way. And they're coming and they're asking for your hand in marriage. Would you like to speak with them? Would you like to communicate with them? Would you like for me to pursue this in any way? And the girl, she responds to her father, yes. I want you to tell them one thing and this is my condition for anyone who wants to marry me. And he says, what is it? He said, if he can perform the night prayer, Salatul Layl, for 40 consecutive days, I will marry him. I don't care what his financial status is. I don't care what his economic position is. I don't care what he is in terms of profession. If he can perform the night prayer 40 consecutive days, I will marry him. King says, sure. You're the boss. He comes out and he tells this mom and her son that look, my daughter has this condition. She's kind of a unique woman, mashallah. And she says that if you can perform Salatul Layl for 40 consecutive days, huh? Then, he, then she will accept your proposal. She doesn't need to see you. She doesn't need to communicate with you. She knows that you are dedicated toward God and she has that sense of conviction to Him as well. So they say, great. I think I can do that, he tells his mom. How difficult could it be? I'll just set my alarm every night. Anyone ever tried to perform Salatul Layl? It's not easy. Salatul Layl, by the way, just a quick parenthesis, can be performed in many different ways. The way as narrated according to Ahlul Bayt والسلام, is not the prayer that you perform before you go to sleep. You perform it after midnight, after midnight, for instance, 12 midnight, it's Muharram, we're awake all night anyway, so I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to go to sleep and then I might wake up for Fajr prayers or I might not. Not that prayer. We're talking about the prayer that is performed in the last third of the night before Fajr prayers. And it actually says, according to our traditions, that you sleep after Salatul Isha and you wake up in the last third of the night to perform that prayer. That's how it has the maximum reward. Anyhow, he says, if you can perform, she says, if you can perform this uh, night prayer for 40 consecutive days, then we will pursue this. So they go back home. Everyone following so far? Okay. Everyone loves stories about love. It's beautiful. So he goes back home, and the first night, he tells his mom, he's like, look, I can do this. Like, this is exactly what I want. So he goes that night, he goes to sleep, he wakes up, he's performing the night prayer. His mom wakes up in the middle of the night, she go and wake him up, and she already sees him standing in Qunud, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Second night, third night, tenth night, twentieth night, thirtieth night, is consecutive. They're having dinner one day when the boy comes back from work. And the mom says, huh, how many, number, how many nights is it? He said, alhamdulillah, 33 nights. He said, great. Only one more week to go, then we go to the king and everything's going to be great. 
He said, I can't wait, Alhamdulillah, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 40 nights performing Salatul Layl every single night in dedication and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 40th night, the next day he went to work, he came back home, they sat down at dinner. And the mom wants to, the son to say that I've done it and let's go out and let's make that proposal. He doesn't say anything. The 42nd day, 43rd day, 45th, 50 days passes and he doesn't say anything to his mom. So the mom gets a little bit worried and a little bit concerned. But she says, you know what? Maybe he's not interested anymore. Maybe he found somebody else. I don't know. So he just goes, she, so she goes toward her neighbor's home one day. And she says, you know, my friend, my son has this circumstance, this situation, and it's been 50 days now, and he hasn't come and told me, and I don't want to be so aggressive anymore. He told me to sort of keep, you know, keep a, keep a distance in regards to this situation. So she said, maybe he's, maybe he's just shy. You know, it's hard to have those conversations. It's hard to tell your parents, I want to get married, I want to marry this person, or come and help me through this process. Sometimes we don't want to have deep, difficult conversations like that. So why don't you go and you take the initiative and you approach him. So he says, okay. She goes the next day. And that night, she said, I'm going to wait one more night. That night, she creeps in the middle of the night and looks to see where her, where his son is. And he's weeping in tears as he's making da'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she said, tomorrow I have to check in on him. Tomorrow he comes home from work and he asks, she asks him, she says, oh my son, it's been 53 nights. You've been performing the night prayer for all of these nights. What about the girl? He says, and what about the girl? What girl are you talking about? What are you even mentioning? He says that the girl, the daughter of the king. He says, what? He said, you know, you started these prayers 40 consecutive nights so you can, can, so you can get to the prerequisite, so you can make the proposal. And he said, oh, her. He said, I completely forgot about her. He said, something changed during the course of those nights. When I saw myself in ded dedication and in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I realized that this life is not about worshipping God so I can attain something in return. But I recognize that there's a sense of beauty, there's a sense of pleasure, and there's a, and there's a, and there's a sense of real deep love that I feel when I connect to my Creator. Which is why in the dua of Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, he states, Allahumma <laughs> salam. He states, Ilahi man dhalladhi dhaqa halawata mahabbatak farama min kabadala, O Allah, who has tasted the sweetness of your love and found anything else. Eventually, he did go make the proposal, got married to the princess, became the next heir to the throne, and so on and so forth. But the moral of the story is what? Difficulties and trials and tribulations, they also have the means to getting you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes that God throws us in a situation that wakes us up from that sense of slumber that we're in. Sometimes he wants to say, I'm putting you through this problem so that you remember me. Now don't worry about everything else. See me in this equation. You lost that job. You're going through that financial hardship. You're going through that difficulty, whatever it might be. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you're really, really, really distant from me right now. And I'm giving you an opportunity to connect with me. And if you don't see God in it at all, then we need to go back and really check ourselves and go back and really understand the purpose of our creation, the reason why we are here present in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another hadith al-Qudsi, He states that, O creation, I created you likay tarba alayya, la likay arba ilayk. He states that I created you so that you may seek some sense of profit and benefit from me, not so that I can take anything from you. My doors are open, all you have to do is see the, that the doors exist so you can open them and find the treasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within it. We get so caught up on everything else except for God. And that's what differentiates Hussein from all of humanity. Is that everything on the 10th of Muharram was that he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. 
And the only thing at the same time that he saw was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My friends, tonight is the night, the seventh of Muharram. And according to different cultures and different traditions, tonight is the night in which I will recollect the tragedy, which is really hard for me to narrate. And everyone from these nights until the 10th of Muharram, please forgive me. Because they're really, really difficult. And they're really, really challenging. It is st stated that on the night of Ashura, Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, he was gathered together, or he gathered together his companions and his family members. And he looked toward all of them and he stated, Oh my dear friends and oh my dear family members, tomorrow is the day in which I have been foreshadowed by my grandfather, the Messenger of God. And I want to notify you all that every single one of us in this tent, including myself, are going to be killed tomorrow. So if you do not want martyrdom, I forgive you. You can go back to your friends. You can go back to your family members. You can go back to whatever you came from. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for everything that you have done. The Imam alayhi salatu wasalam gives everyone a free pass. And I'll speak to more in more detail about this on the night of Ashura. At this moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, he turns off those candles. For those of you who know the story, he lights them up and he sees every single one of the faces of those who are present in front of him, ready and staunch in front of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And then the Imam alayhi salam, he will look towards some of those companions and he will tell them, it's as if that I can see you die like this. And it's as if that I can see you die like that. And then at that moment, there was one small voice that came from the back of the tent. And that tent called out, Ya Am, oh my uncle, you said that every single one of us in the tent are going to be killed tomorrow. Does that include my cousin, the six month old infant? <laughs> Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he doesn't know what to respond to that boy whose voice was awesome the 13-year-old nephew of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the, the, the son of his brother, Imam al Mujtaba. He doesn't know what to respond. So he looks toward him and he states, Ya Qasim, كيف الموت indak? How do you see death? He states, Fiq ya am ya aba abdullah, al mawtu ahla min al as. That in your way, O oh my uncle, O oh Aba Abdullah, death is sweeter than honey. Can you imagine? Imagine the ma'rifah of Qasim ibn al Hassan. This is what this is all about, my friends. That's the line that we want to utilize on the Day of Judgment. That, oh, for you, oh, Aba Abdullah, all of this was worth it. The tears and the wealth and the exhaustion and everything that I gave for you, oh, Aba Abdullah, accept it from us. That in your way, O oh Aba Abdullah, death is sweeter than honey. What is the Imam alayhi salam going to respond to him? He didn't even ask about his own self. He asked about the six month old infant. And he was afraid to tell him that he was also going to be killed on the afternoon of the next day. It is said that the day of Ashura came and the morning of the Azan of Fajr took place and the beginning of the battle took place whereby in the first hour, 50 of the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had been killed. And one by one, the rest of them, they went out and they fought valiantly until they themselves were killed. Ali al Akbar comes toward Imam al Hussein. He himself is killed. And at this moment, it is said that Qasim ibn al Hassan, 13 or 14 years old, he's just a child. He exits the tent and he goes toward his uncle, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and he says, Oh Aba Abdullah, do you give me permission to fight? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he sees the face of this boy that resembled a luminous moon according to traditions, and he states, Oh Qasim, you? How can I let you fight? You're an orphan. Your father allowed for me to, 
take the responsibility to take care of you. There is no way that I can allow for you to fight. And I'll tell you this, my dear brothers and sisters, that whenever any one of the companions of the Imam السلام, came and asked for permission, eventually the Imam, after a little bit of pushing, he would allow for them to go. But when it came to Qasim, immediately he said, absolutely not. Qasim, go back to the tent. There is no way that I'm going to allow for you to go. In a normal instance, when someone does not have to go and risk their life, they would feel a sense of relief. But Qasim, he allowed for tears to flow down from his eyes. And he walked back toward the tent of his mother, Ramla. And he entered into that tent. He was so overcome with grief. Ramla says, oh my son, why are you grieving like this? And she says that my uncle has refused me from going out and fighting today. At this moment, Ramla, she says that, Oh Qasim, do you remember that will of your father, Abba Muhammad, that will of your father, Imam al Hassan? Go and take it out and go and take it to your uncle and tell him, and tell him that you want to go and give yourself in his way. So it is said that they went and they took that paper, they took whatever those leaves or however it was written, and they went back toward Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And imagine what is happening around Aba Abdullah. All of the companions had been killed. It's like Yawm al Qiyamah in one piece of land. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had to endure so much on the day of Ashura. La yawmuk, yawmuk, ya Aba Abdullah. And Qasim comes toward him and he presents him that will of his. Father Imam al Hassan and the Imam alayhi salam, he looks through it and it says, Oh Abba Abdullah, oh my dear brother, many years from this day you will be going through that day of trial and tribulation that our grandfather promised. On that day, make sure that you allow for my son to be a representative of yours on the 10th of Muharram when you are alone in Karbala. At this moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he looks toward Qasim ibn al Hassan and he says, Oh, my dear son, how can I allow for you to go and fight? But the Imam at the same time knows that he has to fulfill the will of his brother Imam al Hassan. So instead of telling him, let yes, do you know what he does? He goes to the floor and he embraces his son. He embraces his nephew. And it is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam begins to begins to weep until he falls unconscious. He falls unconscious twice on the day of Ashura. The first time was when his son Ali al Akbar went out and fought and the second time was when he was bidding farewell to Qasim but my dear brothers and sisters it doesn't get easier for me to narrate this it is said that when they woke up Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he went into the tent and he opened up a box and in that box was the turban of his brother Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba he called Qasim toward him he took the turban he cut it in half and then he tied it around the head of Qasim because he was such a small child the turban of his father would not fit him and then he took the other half and he cut it in two pieces he took that one quarter and he tied it around the waist of Qasim but I ask you all oh my brothers and sisters all those of you who know what happened to Qasim do you know what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had to do with that last piece of cloth he had to pick up the body pieces of Qasim after only a few moments after they were trampled by the horses At this moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he enters into the tent of Zainab and he calls out, La Zainab, Ya Um Kulthum, Ya Ruqayya, Ya Sukaina, Ya, Fur ya Farwa. Qumna, <laughs> stand up at this moment, Liwida al Shabab, so you can send your last salutations upon this young man. They all go and they embrace him, they all go and they kiss him, and the minute when they see him, they say that this man resembles our brother Imam al Azad. Qasim alayhi salam, he looks toward Abba Abdullah. And at this moment, he has a sense of excitement, his bravery, his courage. He's still the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, Oh Abba Abdullah, do you give me permission to fight? So the Imam alayhi salam again doesn't say yes, nor does he say no. So he embraces his son Qasim. His tears begin to flow down from his eyes. And he just points toward the battlefield as if, what is he else is he going to say? It is said that Qasim, he begins to run in toward the middle of the battlefield 
people. He introduces himself as the grandson of the Messenger of God. He states, That if you do not know me, that know that I am from the sons of Hassan, and I am from the grandsons of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And according to a narration, he fought bravely. He killed 62 people until Imam al Hussein alayhi salam exits from the tent and he's watching what is happening. And a man from the army of Banu Umayyah, he says that I swear to God that if this boy who has this face that is as luminous as a moon, if we continue to allow him to fight, he will pierce all of us. So at this moment, he says that I will take all of the sins of the Arabs and be the one to strike this moon. It is said that he runs, he goes toward Qasim, and at this moment, Qasim, he's just a child. He realizes that his slipper has broken, so he lowers his head to fix it. And at this moment, a man comes, and he strikes Qasim ibn al-Azan on the head. And at that moment, everyone else on the day of Ashura, when they were struck, they would call out, As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. But Qasim was just a boy. He didn't have that sense of understanding, so he called out, Aghithni ya Amma. Oh my uncle, come and help me. Oh my uncle, save me. Oh my uncle, the horses. <laughs> Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he exits from the tent. He rushes toward the body of that boy. He looks at it, and the blood is drowning the body of Qasim. One narration states that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, huh? One narration states that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he picks up the body of Qasim and he holds it close to his chest. And it is said that the women they were watching the scene unfold and they saw that the limbs of Qasim they were dragging on the ground. Why? Because the torches had trampled over his body and dismembered his limbs from his joint and it was dragging on the. And Hamid ibn Muslim, he narrates that when I saw Abba Abdullah pick up the body of his nephew Qasim, when he picked it up, he could not lift his back because his back was broken. But I'll leave you with this. This is the end of the majlis, my friends. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he takes the body of Qasim, he goes behind the tent, he places it next to the body of Ali al Akbar, and Zainab does not see Imam al Hussein for a few moments. And then she hears some weeping, she hears some grieving, she exits from the tent, and she sees that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he's lying between the bodies of Ali al Akbar and Qasim. And he's saying, oh my two children, what have they done to you? <laughs> Y'all say.